obviously. Uh, career has looked at media, media violence, uh, child development and adjustment. And he's got a new book out called Parenting in the Zombie Apocalypse, The Psychology of Raising Children in a Time of Horror. Um, and it basically, it looks like a good bit of fun. It takes psychological theory and research across all sort of relevant areas like development and grief and trauma, um, mental illness, stressful environments, and looks at the likely outcomes of caregiving during a hypothetical landscape of the living dead. So if you would help me welcome Professor Steve Kirsch to our first ever Halloween themed brain and behavior <laughs> lecture. So uh, please do, sir, take it away. Well, thank you so much. I am just going to pick a window here to share. And hopefully you'll be able to see. Uh, it looks like it says I'm sharing. Are we good? You hear me and see the PowerPoint? Perfect. Yep. All right. Well, thank you so much for having me and welcome to After the Horror, Childhood Resilience During the Zombie Post Apocalypse. I had initially wanted to talk about resiliency at all levels of the community, family, parent, but it, it was just too broad. So I had to narrow it, narrow it down. So just a bit of a content warning. Look, the zombie apocalypse isn't a pretty place. The post-zombie apocalypse isn't a pretty place. Um, and so, you know, it's not for the faint of heart. Now, the Walking Dead television series in the UK is rated, I think, a 15, with some seasons being rated an 18. And that's because of the dangerous behavior, the threat, and the horror, as well as the violence. Now, my talk doesn't go nearly into the level of grotesque that you would see uh, in the zombie apocalypse on The Walking Dead. I do have some unsavory images, if you will, but those are all um, comic representations, so it shouldn't be too bad. And the other thing is just to let you know is, hey, this is gonna be some spoilers on The Walking Dead comic book and TV show. Now, if you're not a fan of the show, do not worry. Uh, everything that I'm going to be talking about is going to be in context of the topic. So you won't need to know the backstory. I'll provide whatever backstory you need for The Walking Dead. I'll also provide whatever backstory you need for zombies. I don't expect everyone to be a zombie aficionado like, you know, like I am. I don't expect everyone to have hundreds of books in their Kindle that are on zombies or, you know, have watched, you know, you know, 50 or so zombie movies. It would be great if everybody did, but I have no expectations. So I'm going to start the talk by going over Zombies 101. So as it turns out, there are different types of zombies. We have the slow zombie, which is a reanimated corpse. They're dead. They're not coming back to life in any way, shape, or form. And as you can see in the GIF here, they lumber about. They can make uncoordinated grasps. Um, they lack manual dexterity, but if they can get a grip on you, their teeth are quite powerful and it's gonna be all over. Because once it bites in you, that's not a good thing. And it's also the type of zombie you see in Shaun of the Dead. Now then there's the fast zombie. So these are reanimated courses, once again, dead made famous in the Train to Busan movie and World War Z. These guys are a, a nightmare. They, you can see in just this gift, they just can easily overwhelm. And they come at you with full force and full vengeance, much like happens in 28 Days Later and 28 Weeks day Later filmed in the UK. And the zombies here are actually alive. Um, they've contracted a virus, a very virulent, virulent, virulent one that acts quickly. Um, and then they just relentlessly and they thoughtlessly just kill their family members and friends. Now, I usually don't consider them as zombies because they're alive, but I, I checked with the Zombie Research Society and they say they're zombies. So, you know, you got to go with what the Zombie Research Society says, right? Okay, so the next thing we need to look at is what type of zombies are we going to be talking about um, today? Well, I've tried to focus on a zombie apocalypse where children have the greatest likelihood of surviving. And I don't think a quasi-zombie apocalypse or a fast zombie apocalypse will have any children survive. It's just too intense. It's just too much zombie all at once. So we're gonna have a slow zombie apocalypse. Now, any seasoned zombie killer or zombie hunter can take down a single zombie. It's when they're in mass that you have problems. So let's just take a closer look at the slow zombie so you can understand the type of traumatic experiences and stressful experiences children will have 
during the zombie apocalypse and therefore what will need to be overcome as we move into the post-zombie apocalypse. Now these zombies are of singular focus. All they want to do is spread the zombie plague. That's it. They hunt for their prey, they infect their prey, and then they kill the prey. And they'll bite into them and tear out flesh and arteries in order to try to kill them as quickly as possible. But if you're unlucky enough, I guess, to get away with the zombie bite, you're gonna die anyway because of the infection, the disease within that bite or the zombie plague itself, whatever component it's made out of, that's gonna take you out. And once you are dead, you reanimate. You're one of the living dead. Now, I did wanna point out why zombies eat. So zombies can have no stomach. They can take a bite of flesh and it can go flow right out of them. So why are they chewing? Why are they eating? Well, as they bite into the flesh, they are, you know, giving more, a higher dose, if you will, of the plague to their victim. And they keep eating until the victim reanimates. And once they reanimate, they stop because mission accomplished. They've hunted, they've infected, they've killed, and they've given birth to a new zombie. Now, for some reason, they don't reanimate. Well, then it's an all-you-can-eat buffet, and the zombies will just sit there eating until something comes along to attract their attention. So what would attract their attention? Well, zombies are stimulus driven. So any movement, any sound, and for those that have a nose and nasal capabilities, a smell can be enough to attract their attention, take their focus, put it on a new source of prey. And that's actually really useful information when we start talking about how we're gonna get kids to survive the zombie apocalypse, because let's face it, you know, you, if you don't survive the zombie apocalypse, there's no need to even talk about resiliency, right? And so the last thing to mention is, and what kids are gonna need to learn to do is, is you know, how do you kill a slow zombie? And I think everybody knows, everybody knows you gotta destroy the brain. And Sean and Ed here so nicely show us with shovels and cricket bats, I guess, in hand, they are going to take it out. Cricket bats, excuse me. All right. So it's a zombie eat human world. And what do kids need to do to survive so that they can demonstrate resilience later on? Well, first off, they have to defend themselves from the undead. So they're going to need to learn how to kill the undead. They're going to need to be somewhat comfortable at it. So it becomes second nature. They're also going to need to learn how to hide from the dead. Because if, sometimes a fight isn't what you need. Sometimes there's just too many zombies and you need to be able to hide and let the zombie horde move on by. And at other times when there are no hiding places, well, then you have to hide in plain sight. You have to hide among them. As we see here once again in Shaun of the Dead, and honestly, Shaun and his band of miscreants here, I don't think that's the world's best zombie mimicking behavior, but nevertheless, it gets into the Winchester, so I get it, it worked. Okay. So again, we need to help children survive so we can get them to thrive later on in the form of resilience. And the key to their survival is going to be desensitization. Now, for the purposes of the zombie apocalypse, desensitization is going to mean the decreased level of responsiveness to things that are vile, disgusting, or otherwise unpleasant. And let's face it, zombies are all of those things. They look diseased, they look disfigured, they look dead, they smell dead. There's nothing about their appearance that would make you want to approach them. You'd want to stay away. Um, and sometimes though you have no choice. Your only choice is to approach and then to kill. And of course, you have to become desensitized to the act of destroying a zombie's brain and all that that entails. All right, so if we desensitize youth then to summarize, they can easily brain a zombie and then they're gonna easily be able to cover themselves in zombie guts and walk among them. Hiding will be easier too because they, can, they won't be as fearful as a zombie walks by because they know what a zombie responds to and they won't provide that to the zombie. So how do we desensitize youth? Well, we have them play games, right? Isn't that obvious? We always have kids play games to help them develop. And so I have here for you some zombie games. And each of these games is going to help the child develop some capabilities that will allow them to survive the zombie apocalypse. And then I promise after that, we'll move on to talking about the capabilities that need to develop in order to have resilience. 
Now, if you're going to desensitize kids, you really need to provide live, live zombies. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Of course, you have to properly prepare the zombie if you don't want to have the participants become zombies themselves. So here we have Michonne from The Walking Dead, and she's actually, I don't know if you can see it well enough, she has cut off the zombie's lower jaw. I actually recommend doing that and also pulling out the upper teeth. That way you don't have any sharp areas that could scratch the child. She cuts off the arms at the shoulder. I'd recommend probably doing it at the wrist. That way you, wrist, excuse me, that way you can get the arms moving about as the zombie tries to grab the child, but they won't have their hands in order to do it. So also make sure there's no sharp bone anywhere because clearly we, we don't want a child to get impaled. Now, if we successfully do that, then we can have kids play these zombie games. And in addition to desensitization, they're also gonna help the child develop other aspects of survival that they will need or other aspects of, or other capabilities, I should say, that will help them survive. So let's just briefly go over these. First up, we have zombie tag. Um, and this is just like a regular game of tag where, you know, the, the person runs around being chased by whoever is it. In this case, the zombies are it. So this is a great game for cardio. It's a great game for agility. And if you want to increase the difficulty of it, you just add more zombies to the mix. Next, we have mimic the zombie, right? This is where you have to practice being a zombie with the moan, with the lumbering about, with the stutter step movements. And the goal of this game is to not trigger hunting behavior. So, you know, if you can do that, you win. And you can also desensitize to like the smells and things of that by, again, like we saw in the previous slide, putting zombie guts all over the individual. Now, my personal favorite is Whack a Zombie. Now, I don't know if they have this in the UK, but this is basically what the game looks like. Um, it looks like Whack a Mole, um, which is a game where um, you know, the moles pop out. And actually it's whack-a-mole that I wasn't sure they had in the UK because obviously I haven't licensed whack-a-zombie yet. So nobody has it. All right. So zombies, pop, uh, excuse me, moles pop out of the hole and you whack them. And this is great for kids to practice smashing a brain and becoming desensitized to cracking open a skull. And so we don't use moles though. We use zombie heads, right? And then those zombie heads keep popping out. And that's how we get the desensitization. Just a few more games and then we're gonna move on to the apocalypse. So then we have Zombie in the Middle, another great game for cardio, but importantly, it really takes a focus on distraction. Remember, zombies are stimulus driven as we pointed out. So if you can distract a zombie's attention away from prey, they'll go towards the distraction. And that's what this game is all about, learning how to distract. Next, we have Hide and Seek with Zombies, which you know, as we saw in the slide before with the kids hiding under cars, this is really important to be quiet. And honestly, if the parents need a couple hour break, it's a good game to play as well. You can just put them in one place and then have them practice patiently waiting there. And of course, the seekers are zombies, by the way. So again, that adds to the level of difficulty of the game. So two left. First is MacGyver that zombie, which is named after the famed TV character. And it was very popular in the United States, and I did see that it is carried in the UK. But if you're not familiar with the show, MacGyver is just a guy who can solve all of the world's problems by thinking outside of the box. With a pencil and a paperclip, he can defuse a bomb. He can create a weapon capable of saving himself and those around him. So MacGyver the zombie is based on that. We give kids household and found objects, and we have them create a weapon capable of piercing a skull and destroying the brain. So they get household objects, they get found objects, they get duct tape, and when they create their weapon, they go over to a zombie's head, which is an advice, and see if they can crack it open. And last, we have zombie head dodgeball. Now, again, I'm not familiar if you have dodgeball in the UK, but basically you have two teams and they just throw balls at each other and you try to hit another person and if you hit them, they don't catch it, they're out. Now, this is a controversial game, I'll grant it, because you're actually throwing zombie heads. It's meant to desensitize kids to the feel of the zombie and the touch of the zombie, because unfortunately, they will be having to grab zombie. It's also good for agility and moving about in teamwork, because you have other team members. All right. 
So those are the games, and there's only one thing left to talk about as to whether or not these games are really or should be a spectator sport. And the answer is absolutely they should be a spectator sport. Observational learning is the key when you learn by observing others. And so when you watch other kids play the games, you can get clues as to what they did that worked or what they did that didn't work. So they're going to get the experience of the games themselves, which will teach them what they need to know to survive, and they'll also learn by watching others. Okay, we understand what zombies are, we understand how they work, and we understand what we need kids to do in order to survive. So let's bring on the zombie apocalypse. Now, the zombie apocalypse refers to that initial onslaught of The Walking Dead. This is when everybody is caught by surprise. They look at grandma who's sick, and grandma seems to suddenly get better because she's up. And the next thing you know, Zaman's, grandma's eating their face. So a lot of people get caught by surprise in the zombie apocalypse. And that's why survivability estimates are very low. One study out of the University of Leicester found that if 90% of the living dead infect one person a day, well, within 100 days, only 300 people are going to be left worldwide. Now, there are other more forgiving models that suggest with military involvement as much as like 12% of the population could survive. So the world population is somewhere around 7.8 billion, which might put it around 950 million survivors. Um, so the actual number will be probably somewhere in between, but it won't matter. Wherever you are, that's your apocalypse. That's what you have to survive. Now, the post-zombie apocalypse is basically when survivors have started to rebuild. Now, the dead aren't completely gone. They're just more manageable. It's easy to handle them. You know what to do. The exact point where the zombie apocalypse turns into the post-zombie apocalypse, well, that's an argument for philosophers to debate. We're just going to say the post-zombie apocalypse has happened. And we're going to look to see how resiliency can develop in the post-zombie apocalypse after facing tremendous adversity and the zombie apocalypse. So adversity means the threats to well-being and physical health. And I know, I know what you're saying. You're saying, what's so adverse about a zombie apocalypse? I mean, come on. So let's just talk about some of the things in case you're not aware. First off, there's gonna be food and medication scarcity, right? Shelves are going to, the food on shelves is going to disappear. Um, medicine is going to be ransacked and taken and hoarded. And there's gonna be no replacements. And so people are going to starve, people are going to get sick, we're going to get disease, we're going to get illness, and those won't be able to be treated because we won't have medications. And in and, and all honesty, we're not going to have doctors either because hospitals are going to be, you know, the main point for the zombie apocalypse explosion because as everyone's sick is going to go to them. And without doctors and without nurses, we're going to have a lot of injuries that might or that are treatable not be treatable, leading to either intense pain or infection that results in death. And so there's going to be a lot of death. There's going to be death due to disease and illness and injury. There's going to be death due to zombies. And there's going to be death due to other humans because the world is not the nicest place when, the, when it falls, right? We're going to get a societal breakdown. We're going to get lawlessness. There are going to be looters. There are going to be people who readily take advantage of others. So that makes, again, the zombie apocalypse very dangerous and lots of violence, constant exposure to violence. And all of this is going to lead to potential mental health problems. So I'm just going to highlight the ones that are, I view as most likely to occur, which would be anxiety-based disorders, depressive-based disorders, and post-traumatic stress. All right, so we're going to see many health, mental health conditions. And of course, probably the biggest adverse condition that we're going to face in the zombie apocalypse is going to be toilet paper scarcity. Honestly, this one is, is going to be bad. In fact, if I were you, I would right now look up how to make your own toilet paper or look up how to um, make toilet paper because here we have two, um, you know, individuals who are fighting it out over a roll of toilet paper and, and there aren't even zombies. This is just the pandemic. So you got to wonder what's going to happen when no more toilet paper is in sight. All right. Now we've just talked about factors for adversity and those are actually called risk factors because they increase the likelihood of negative outcomes. 
Now there's actually something called protective factors. And in terms of adversity, they keep the negative effects at bay. They reduce the impact of the negative factor or they make the child less vulnerable to it. Um, I'm gonna highlight just one at each level that can influence the child, the level of the child themselves, their parents, the family, and the community. So temperament is a biological basis of personality. It predisposes a child to act and be in particular ways. Maybe they're a thrill seeker, maybe they're shy. But what we'd be concerned about in the zombie apocalypse is, are they, do they cry a lot? Are they easy to soothe? Are they difficult to soothe? Because remember, you know, when you have an upset child, that is going to potentially be adverse to their own well-being because it can create negative, or it can lead to negative effects from parents that are having difficulty dealing with their own stress. And again, not to mention that a crying child is basically ringing a dinner bell for zombies who are gonna be coming and they're gonna bring friends. So parenting. Parenting is, can be a protective factor for adversity or from adversity or a risk factor for it. You know, when parents are warm and affectionate that can help keep other risk factors at bay. And if they're insensitive and punitive, well, that's going to in and of itself be a risk factor. Um, next we have families, right? If a family gets along well, if they're cohesive, if they have a, a sense of community within the family, you know, that can prevent other risk factors such as those at the level of the parent or the child, they can reduce their impact. But if it's a coercive family environment, if it is filled with arguments and deception and manipulation and conflict, well, that family then in and of itself is gonna be a risk factor. And then finally, we have um, the idea of having a community as being a risk factor or a protective factor. When there are resources available, if there's a shared sense of responsibility, that can protect from other risk factors that are present at the level of the child, family, or parent. But if they don't, if there are few community supports, if it's filled with violence, then we end up with an additional risk factor for adversity. So let's put the idea of risk factors and protective factors together with what we expect to happen during the zombie apocalypse and post-zombie apocalypse. So during the zombie apocalypse, we expect risk factors to overwhelm protective factors. Just parents and children and families and the community themselves aren't going to have the capability to reduce the impact of all of the negative things that are happening. And so we're going to get horrendous adversity. Now, during the zombie, the post-zombie apocalypse, excuse me, um, we're going to see protective factors increase. Maybe they'll even be greater than the risk factors or equal to them. But the point is, is that these protective factors that emerge during the post-zombie apocalypse, well, they're going to make adversity manageable. And if you can make adversity manageable, then you have a chance of resilience. So that leads us into talking about what factors increase resilience. And so, sorry, zombie Bob Ross, resilience isn't just a happy little accident. Resilience takes a village that's been cleared of the dead. So let's take a closer look at resilience in the post-zombie apocalypse. First off, a definition. Now, resilience is the ability to cope with, adjust, or recover from adversity. And it doesn't mean there are no negative emotions. It doesn't mean that people um, never feel sad or anxious or upset but it means in the face of stress, they're able to handle it and move forward. So as Donald Meichenbaum from the Melissa Institute says, resilience turns victims into survivors and, survive, and allows survivors to thrive. One of the best examples of that comes from The Walking Dead comic, and this is probably the most gory image that I have. This is Carl from The Walking Dead comic books, and he's had a rough apocalyptic life. And it's not just because he had his eye shot out. When he was very, when he was nine and 10, his mother and baby sister were killed in a battle between communities. She was shot. Baby unfortunately died as well. Uh, his father ends up getting remarried for, or gets a, a partner, and the de facto stepmother dies from a zombie bite later on. So he's lost a mother, he's lost a stepmother, and he was also a violent child. At about age nine or 10, he shot family friend and protector Shane, who was threatening his father. Not too long after that, he actually killed, I think, a five or six-year-old child. See, there was a set of twins, and one twin killed the other, and 
Carr felt the adults weren't going to do anything about it, so it was up to him to administer justice. So he shoots this other six-year-old. So in a matter of a year or so, he's killed an adult and a child. And this continues on. He becomes a violent adolescent. So, so far, we're not seeing anything that remotely resembles resiliency. And yet, time passes, and Carl develops into uh, a citizen who marries, who has a child, and has a good relationship. So again, that gives us hope that resiliency can occur. So in order to understand how we get to resiliency, right, we need to look at the contributors to it. Now, Carl didn't develop resiliency until he was an adult. We're going to talk about resilience during childhood. Now, just like there were levels of or factors that can contributed to, um, to adversity at the level of the child, parent, family, and community, there also contributors to resilience that occur at these levels as well. In fact, it's almost like a laundry list of factors. So to try to, try to provide a little bit of organization to it, I want you to think about how the factors that I'm going to be talking about help children build, enhance, or restore capabilities. And I'm going to focus just on four, just for time and just to keep things focused. One is a sense of control, right? Nothing like an apocalypse to make a child or anyone feel out of control. And if you're out of control, resiliency is not going to be easy to come by. Competence. When, they, you know, when research is done on real world kids who are resilient, they demonstrate that they feel competent, that they can take on tasks and complete them. Um, and again, when the apocalypse hits, competence falls apart as nothing you seem to be able to do seems right. Connecting with others is also characteristic of kids that develop childhood resilience. Uh, and again, during the zombie apocalypse, this is a disaster. Family members are killed throughout. So new connections are going to need to be made. And finally, family and community and friends can help children find meaning in adversity. And if they can do that, then they're going to be well on their way to becoming resilient. So going back to the level of resilience, uh, uh, contributors to resilience of the level of the child, the parent, the family, and community, let's see how each of these holds up during the zombie apocalypse and then during the post-zombie apocalypse. Okay, so characteristics of the child. So one thing that research has clearly stated is that kids that have problem-solving abilities are tend to be resilient, right? Pro, you know, the ability to face a problem, find a solution, is going to increase competence. It's also going to increase feelings of control. Similarly, having a sense of adaptability is going to be important as well. You know, when circumstances change, if you get in a rut, if you can't change with them, it's going to be very difficult to figure out what needs to be done because everything you do is going to be wrong, which will be detrimental to competence and detrimental to feelings of control. Now, behavioral and emotional self-regulation are very important, um, really for survival, too, because if you have a tantruming toddler, again, that is just a, a big signal to bring in a bunch of zombies. But if you can remain in control of your emotions and in control of your behavior, then feelings of control are going to be gen are going to generate as well. And if you can control your emotions and your behavior, you're going to be able to be competent in situations that require you to focus on a task. And also it will help with establishing relationship because if you're angry and you're hostile and you lash out at people, it's gonna be difficult to develop connections to others. So that gets to the next point, right? These connections. Kids that are shown to be resilient have empathy. They understand what other people are feeling and going through. They demonstrate caring and they're competent. They know what to do in given situations. So that's going to be important and shown for resilience. And it's something that may disappear at the start as well. And so during the zombie apocalypse, that's what I expect. You know, it's going to be difficult to attain or maintain any of these characteristics or contributors. Problem solving, um, adaptation, emotional behavior regulation, when the world is falling apart, it is going to be very difficult for kids to be able to have a functional state of these that could actually contribute to resiliency. But, you know, during that post-zombie apocalypse, they're going to reemerge. Next, let's talk about characteristics of the parent. Now, parents that have resilient children are able to use support that's available to them. 
if they need to provide the child with something tangible or they need support so that they can parent effectively, they'll make use of it. They're also aware of their children's limitations and they'll take appropriate precautions. So if they have an impulsive child, they'll make sure to keep tracks of them. Maybe they even have to tether themselves to the child because let's face it, during the zombie apocalypse, one or two steps away from a parent, well, that could put that child in the arms of a zombie. So it's gonna be very important for the parents to understand what their children can do and provide structure around them when they need it. They're also adaptable. And they're adaptable to the child's developmental changes and the environmental changes that will affect their children, right? So a child that's 10, is going to be very different than a child that's 13 and the type of parenting involved is going to need to change as well. And so parents of resilient children are able to make that change. And they're also able to adjust their parenting depending upon their current circumstances. You know, are they held up in a bunker? Is the child able to roam free without worry of being, you know, eviscerated by a zombie? So these are adjustments that parents of resilient kids will be able to make. And they're also going to be able to make sensitive, responsive and care that's available and attuned to the child's needs. Now, during the zombie apocalypse, right, parents are gonna be dealing with all of their own issues. And they're gonna be facing so much adversity that it may make it difficult for them to meet the caregiving responsibilities uh, that they have. The best example and most horrifying example is from The Walking Dead. So this is Carl, this is Rick, father, son. Carl has just witnessed his mother die during a cesarean section. It was an emergency cesarean section performed with a large knife that was not done on, under anesthetic and not performed by a surgeon, right? And unfortunately, his mother dies. Not only does his mother die during childbirth, but Carl is the one that prevents her reanimation by shooting her in the head. So he comes out having experienced all of this trauma. And Rick, by looking at his face, senses that Lori has died. Um, does Rick provide comfort to Carl? Does, is he sensitive to Carl's needs? No. He provides no emotional support. He doesn't even give a hug. All he does is grab an axe and go in an axe and go inside the building to take you know, revenge on the dead. And later he still has trouble, you know, dealing with adversity as, as he starts talking to his dead wife, um, sort of hallucinating these conversations. So the fact is, Rick is far gone, too far gone to be an effective parent. Now, sensitivity, responsivity, and available care is gonna be important, as I said, to developing resilience. And one of the things um, that we've seen is, sorry, one of the things that we've seen is that many parents become punitive in the hopes of protecting their children. Um, research out of Syrian refugees demonstrates this. A bunch of parents have been interviewed and they talk about how when they're in these camps and they're, and they're walking along, they really wanna maintain control of the children because they're worried that something's gonna happen to them. So they engage in more punitive care than they normally would. All right, so parenting that's ineffective is not going to lead to resilience. But over the course of the post-apocalypse, again, resiliency can, um, is more likely to happen as parents are able to experience a resilience of their own individual development and then are better able to care for their children. All right, so next we talk about characteristics of the family. So families that have an open exchange of ideas. Now, this isn't about letting a child make a decision. This is about letting a child feel they're contributing to the family and giving them a sense of control, at least in terms of their ideas. And competence and control can also develop when there are roles and rituals and routines that the family typically engages in. And so children that show resilience have these characteristics in their family. And of course, the families also demonstrate acceptance and positive regard for one another, which is a key component of connection to others. And identity is gonna be important as well. You know, maybe they're farmers, maybe they're scavengers, but this is gonna give a sense shared of purpose, knowing and, and a further way of connecting with the family. So when we look at kids who demonstrate resilience and we look at their families, the families have more capabilities than the demands they face, meaning that the family as a whole can work together to take care of the demands and make them unaffected by them. During the apocalypse though, again, nothing 
of this sort is going to happen, right? First off, families are going to change. Parents are going to die. Grandparents are going to die. Siblings are going to die. Uh, children are going to die. Family constellations will change dramatically. In fact, this picture here takes place shortly after um, um, a battle in which um, Carl's, well, actually, no, this is, um, sorry, I'm getting that confused with the comic book. This family here actually is comprised of people that are not really connected except for not too long ago. Um, Lizzie and Mika here, they're siblings. Carol has agreed to adopt them because their father has just died. This is baby Judith, who we saw in the previous screen, their mother, Carl's mother died. This was the baby that was born during Cesarean. And this is Tyrese, who just happens to be with them. And they look like a happy functioning family, but they're not, right? As it turns out, family demands overwhelm their family capabilities. You see, Lizzie here, she is has had difficulty being in touch with reality. She thinks that she can talk to zombies and she thinks that she can, um, um, that being a zombie is a perfectly fine state of being. So she actually kills her sister Mika. So that leaves the baby left alive. And Tyrese and Carol are very much concerned about the baby and they don't know what to do. They're incapable of dealing with the demands of the situation. And so what ends up happening is that Carol ends up shooting um, poor Lizzie here in order to resolve the problem. Now, that's a horrible thing to happen and a horrible thing to see. But during the post-zombie apocalypse, we're going to see new identities. We're going to see new activities. We're going to see family capabilities coming back and overwhelming. So, you know, we're going to see families have, hey, let's check the perimeter night instead of family game night. In the end, then, we're going to go back to that factor that can lead to resilience, which is a functioning family that has routines and rituals and positive regard for one another. All right. So next, let's talk about contributors to childhood resilience at the level of the community. And there are many, but I'm just going to isolate two. First off, collective competence deals with the ability of the community to meet the needs of the child, meet its members' needs. Um, it's putting plans into action. So it's having resources and making sure children get them. So kids that demonstrate childhood resilience um, are able to get the informational support they need, the social support they need, whatever support they need they're able to get. And the other thing that seems to be characteristic of children that are resilient is a sense of shared responsibility. The community feels that it's responsible for the individual members, and the individual members feel that they are responsible for the community as well. And of course, all of that gets just totally destroyed during the zombie apocalypse. But eventually, small communities can, you know, small groups will band together, and those groups will get larger and larger, and then you'll have new communities. And so you can get the reemergence of collective competence, and you can get reemergence of shared responsibility, and you can get emergence of, of new beliefs and norms. One of my favorites is actually from the zombie television show Z Nation, where um, the process of giving someone mercy is what you do um, to, to prevent them from coming back to life as a zombie. So when someone's about to die, People get together, they say a prayer, they have a gathering, and then they administer mercy to the individual. So it's a nice way of a community to come together to protect one another, because coming back from the dead puts everybody at risk. So once again, decimated during the zombie apocalypse, but re-emerging afterwards. Okay, so let's talk about the nature of resilience during the post-zombie apocalypse. First off, each level of resilience has the potential to influence the other, right? A functioning community can have resources that parents can use that can make them better parents, which can make the family get along better, which can lead the child to develop competencies and control and connections to others that they otherwise wouldn't be able to. So you can actually trickle down from the community to the child, but you can also trickle up. A child that has emotional and behavioral self-control isn't going to stress out their parents as much. And parents that aren't stressed can be more effective with their parenting and other members in the family. And that can open up and make available resources for them to contribute to the community and be active members in the community that way. Next, there does seem to be a dose-response relationship between adversity 
in the zombie apocalypse and post zombie apocalypse resilience, where the larger the dose of stress and trauma during the zombie apocalypse, whether at once or accumulated over time, the less likely you are to see post-apocalyptic resilience. Next, we need to talk about how resilience is a dynamic process. It can be present at one point in time, but absent in another. So imagine you have a 10 year old who was in the zombie apocalypse from five to six or seven years of age, and then the post zombie apocalypse arrives and they seem to be doing fine. They're showing connections to family. They feel in control. They're very competent in whatever academics or activities are planned for them. But then they hit adolescence. And now adolescence is time of struggling to figure out who, what your identity is. And it's a new world. And now the child struggles. So the absence of resilience at one point in time doesn't mean it will never appear. We saw that with Carl who lacked it in childhood but gained it in adulthood. But also the presence of resilience at one point in time doesn't mean it's gonna be there. So parents need to be aware of that. The other thing to mention is that resilience is not a global state of being. That individual can be resilient in one context but vulnerable in a completely another way. So, <clears throat> Maybe somebody is um, socially very competent, uh, connected well to others, but for whatever reason, they don't do well academically, assuming there's new schools around. So it's possible to do one well in one area and not another. Now, as we move towards the end, I wanna talk about three possible effects of adversity on resilience. First, we have an inoculation effect. This is when much like a vaccine, early stress um, allows you to handle later stress better. So the stress of the zombie apocalypse, you know, is it allows you to handle stress during the post-zombie apocalypse and demonstrate resilience. Now, another type of effect is sensitization, and this is the opposite, really. Um, rather than being inoculated, you're sensitized. So stress in the zombie apocalypse makes you sensitive to post-zombie apocalyptic stress, which is gonna make resilience difficult to obtain, right? And when you have difficulties in obtaining resilience, this is gonna mean that there's gonna be an increase in anxiety, depression, and post-traumatic stress. So in that case, resilience is difficult to obtain. It's going to be incredibly difficult to obtain when you have stress amplification effects. And this is when an earlier stress leads to very intense reactions. So the trauma of the zombie apocalypse, when faced with new stressors in the post-zombie apocalypse, they just get overwhelmed and it makes anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress likely to happen and severe to be severe, likely to be severe as well and to last a long period of time. So those are the three possible outcomes and it begs the question, well, Will the zombie apocalypse lead to inoculation, sensitization, or amplification? And in many ways, it depends on exposure to adversity. In low adverse events, you know, they may not be stressful enough to create new coping skills. I mean, if you lived in a gated community or survival bunker, you might never face enough adversity in order to allow you, when you go out into the open and into the world of the post-zombie apocalypse, to handle the stressors there. So resilience in that case seems unlikely. And under high adverse conditions, well, you know, you're going to develop negative coping strategies. So rather than getting capabilities such as control and competence and connection, with those seemingly out of sight, kids are going to engage in risky behavior, drug use, avoidance, hostility, aggression, all of the things that we saw Carl engaging in when he was a child and an adolescent. So it looks like high adversity there sensitized him or amplified the effect of the post-zombie apocalypse. And that's what I would expect to see. So what situations would lead to inoculation? Well, most likely moderate exposure. It's gonna be strong enough to create effective strategies of control and competence and connection to others, while at the same time not overwhelming the system. <clears throat> All right. So finally, I wanna leave you with some perspective and hope. And this is based on real world data that is post zombie apocalyptic relevant. So um, research out of the Melissa Institute has shown that adult combat veterans coming back 70% show no long term psychiatric issues. I do want to differentiate percent from raw numbers, because if we had 100,000 people, 
come back from war and 70% do fine, that still means 30,000 are in need of help. So I'm in no means minimizing that those, that there are gonna be a lot of people in need. But what this is meant to show is just the likelihood of resilience occurring and the proportion in which it occurs, because many people think it's an unlikely event. Data out of Sierra Leone show that 72% of kids that were conscripted into war as child soldiers do not show criteria that meet, or does not do not meet criteria for post-traumatic stress. And they also, they have subclinical levels of anxiety and depression. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not anxious or have depressive symptoms or have post-traumatic symptoms, but they're not at the level that would result in being diagnosed with those conditions. Out of the United States, research has shown that kids that experience any type of trauma, that one half to two thirds show no long-term problems. Of course, there's gonna be short-term problems and the need for care and comfort and possibly therapy. But in the long-term, it looks like there is more um, positive or resilient outcomes than not. And the last issue in real-world data has to do with the witness to loss of life, which is gonna be prominent during the zombie apocalypse. 75% of kids and, or individuals, I should say, that witness significant loss of life due to war or some horrible environmental event, they do not experience long-term stress. So when we put all this together and we apply it to the zombie apocalypse, you know, first off, we can say resilience is the rule. It's not the exception to the rule. And if that's the case, then much like Carl, there's hope for children of the post-zombie apocalypse. So thank you so much. Happy Halloween. And I guess if now there's time for questions, we can talk about that. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and hopefully people are still there. <laughs> All right. Fantastic, thank you, Steve. Yes, so we'll open it up for questions now. Also, feel free to type in your questions. Oh yeah, let me pull up the chat. Hi, Steve. Thanks for thanks for that talk. Um, I'm going to ask a bit of a mean question, which is okay. uh, probably a little bit of a pessimistic question as well. It was it's always nice to end these sorts of talks mm -hmm. on uh, a positive <laughs> note. But um, the, there's a difference in my mind between. Um, what would happen in the po in, in the zombie apocalypse in terms of individual training for people from the general public versus combat veterans mm -hmm. so while it's sure. the case that a lot of combat veterans don't necessarily come back from war with uh post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms mm -hmm. um it's likely that they've had training to get through that that we generally sure. wouldn't so how relevant are data like that in terms of thinking about the effects that something like this might have on us? Well, the talk was really focused on childhood resilience. Um, and I did throw that in there, but I'd like to point out that the children conscripted into war aren't really receiving training. These are kids that are just stolen from their families, thrown into the front lines, used as a shield, used as human shields, forced into battle, uh, come home, sometimes they're ostracized from their community. I think that's actually the most relevant um, of those. Um, the others were just uh, meant to show that resilience is um, a phenomenon that typically occurs in a way that we might not expect. I was most shocked when I saw the data on the children that were child soldiers and, and, and that they were doing as well as they were given the lack of support in any mechanisms that we could talk about at the child, family, environment, or community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I suppose I'm really interested in the child soldier data as well. Um, mm -hmm. separate, this is totally separate from the, the question I actually had in my mind, but I am, <clears throat> I am really interested in that in part because I think while the data do provide some, you know, a, a thread to hold on to for hope, um, surviving is not thriving. And mm -hmm. I'd like, you know, I'd really be interested in, in what longer term data there are um, for yeah. these children. <clears throat> Absolutely. I mean, I, I fully agree. I mean, you know, what the data that I found was looking at was the presence of uh, like diagnosable mental illness. I mean, I was really working hard here to find a silver lining. 
Um, I am very pessimistic. In fact, the end of my book is like, hey, listen, guess what? Um, if we don't if we don't pay attention to the past, we're going to repeat it. And the world's full of hate groups. So people are going to use the apocalypse to finish off what has been started millennia ago. So that's, you know, sort of my view of things. Um, but absolutely, it's, it's, and given the dynamic process of resilience and how it can be present at one time and absent in another, we do need to, you know, continue on in the research. And, and I'm honestly, I'm not an expert in this enough to even give um, any more of an answer than that. So sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's my bad for for following the line kind of out out into space. I'll come back to zombies. <laughs> the reason I was really interested in yeah. in having your talk is um, because I myself have taught a neuroscience of zombies mm -hmm. course, and I found it incredibly helpful mm -hmm. as a hook to get into neuroanatomy, sort of structure and function. Yes. And you know, looking at um, well, all of it, cordyceps and parasites, and mm -hmm. you know, sure. all of the ways in which we have we have control. And so for me, zombies was a hook to get better engagement with mm -hmm. the material that I mm -hmm. consider to be my bread and butter. And I'm wondering sure. how you found your way to it. Oh, so, um, you know, like you, um, I wanted to use zombie apocalypse as a hook because like I, I mentioned, I love zombies. I mean, I, I grew up loving the movies. I play video games. I read virtually hundreds of books and, um, I wanted to teach an honors course and I thought, well, what better way to in integrate, you know, my knowledge of developmental psychology and parenting with my passion for zombies than to create a course. And I was inspired by the zombies dream of undead sheep, which I'm, I'm sure, you know, um, and uh, I used that actually in the, in the course. And then after teaching the course, I was like, well, you know, there are no textbooks on this, so let me see if I can write my own. And so it really was more like, okay, uh, this is a bucket list sort of item for me. I'm going to write a book on parenting the zombie apocalypse and and see how it was, how it goes. So, and that's how it went. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I actually I did use when zombies uh, or do don't zombies dream of undead sheep. It's a cracking book. Yeah. All right, um, we probably have time for one more question. Anybody out there? It's like any class I have. No, no. You know it's five to five where you are. People are like, all right, I got dinner on the, the stove. We got to get yeah. to that. So I, I fully understand. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Right. Well, then we will let it rest at that. But thank you so much, thank Steve. You. We really appreciate your contributions today. Um, well, thank, thank you, you so for much. having me. Yeah. Happy Halloween. You too. All righty. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Happy Halloween. Bye.